Is it okay if we yeah. start with them? Yeah, let's go ahead. So, right. so Mo, we're changing the order a little bit to, we're gonna start with the Michigan Merit Examination process. Is that what we're yeah, doing, Ron? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to the MME preparation and procedures, and uh, there's a nice PowerPoint on the screen here. So maybe you have it. I have it. All right, great. Good afternoon, Dr. Dr. Baker, Pastor Moody, uh, Ms. Slade. Uh, what I what I did is I put together an update of uh, MME and ACT. Uh, just so that you're aware of the dates, uh, the progress that each school is making, and the progress that's being made in the division. Uh, just a little bit of background information on March 4, 5, and 6, uh, the high school division, uh, many jun most juniors and some seniors will take a high stakes examination, uh, which, will determine, uh, which will determine our accountability status in the state of Michigan. This is the highest stakes test uh, we will take in the high school division this year. See on the slide, it's comprised of the ACT on day one, uh, the work keys on day two, and then a Michigan MEEP like test on day three. So we have about uh, eight more days to prepare as the students were not in school uh, yesterday and today. Just a little bit of background information, five year trend information on ACT. It's probably the easiest to report. It's the one that the students take the most seriously because it gets them into school. As you can see from 2008 uh, through 2013, we've been on an upward trajectory. Uh, last year was the first year that we went over that 17 threshold for the first time. Uh, 16 in the eyes of ACT is at the beginning of college readiness. So uh, getting over that 17.1 was uh, no small task. And we, can, we, we believe that we will uh, score even higher this year will show you some evidence on why I feel that way. So this is the first school I would like to uh, showcase. Um, on, on my left is the composite score of Grand Rapids Montessori High School. This is a small sample size. Uh, it's the smallest group of high school kids uh, that we will test. Notice that when their students took their junior class, took the assessment in September, they scored a 17.9. When we reassess those kids in December uh, or early January, uh, they went up to an 18.4 for 0.5 uh, area uh, of growth. And you'll see their scores from last year, which you're comparing a different cohort where they had an 18.8. So we believe uh, if we make a, uh, a similar gain that we made from uh, September until December, we will surpass last year's cohort scores. City High, City High was a school last year that had a significant uh, dip in achievement uh, relating to the ACT. Uh, when they tested their students in September, their students had a composite score of 23.9. When they reassessed in December, they had a 25.1. And what gives us a lot of optimism here is that in their mid-year assessment, they have already gone considerably past what that group scored last year. So City had a composite of 23.9 last year. In December of this year, they're already at a 25.1. Uh, if we can get a similar gain, we'd probably be the highest achieving high school in the state. Uh, but uh, if we can even maintain or do a little bit better, it will be considerably better than last year. Uh, UPREP, Grupa. You'll notice that when their students took the pretest in September, they had a 14.8. Uh, when they tested again in January, they almost had a one point jump. They're about 0.9. Last year was the first year that UPREP uh, took the Michigan Merit exam. So their baseline data truly is baseline, the first time they've ever taken it. 16 won last year. We think that is more than attainable this year as the students have already hit that 15.7. Innovation Central is a really messy slide, but uh, as you know, Innovation Central is a brand new school with a brand new school code. Just to give you some comparisons, what I did is I put uh, three boxes below because this shows you the students uh, that entered uh, Innovation Central. So when I'm referencing Central, uh, that's the School of Health Science from last year. And under Mr. Frost's leadership, they had a 16.3 composite score. 
the Creston cohort of students, um, which their junior class last year, uh, those students had a 16.5. And then the Academy of Design and Construction, if you remember, that was the uh, cohort of kids that had nothing but exclusively online instruction. And you'll see that their composite scores were 15.1. Um, they went almost one point up from the fall assessment to the winter assessment. Um, what I'm really using to gauge them is something in between the Central and Creston group, so like a 16.4. I think we can easily hit that number if we have comparable gains uh, in March. Uh, Ottawa Hills, uh, we started uh, in the fall with a 13.4 composite score, so much lower than many of the other schools that I've just referenced. But there's lots of optimism because there's a tremendous amount of growth, uh, especially in the area of science or the areas of science and English. And even math and reading had some slight bumps as well. Uh, their growth from September to December is 1.2. Uh, please remember that Ottawa Hills is a priority school, and this is a very important year for Ottawa Hills. Uh, our hope is if we have similar growth from January until March, uh, that we will be able to uh, surpass that 15.7 from the previous year. But we really started out in, in such a low point. So if uh, Mr. Lewis and his team are able to do that, we're talking about over two points, almost three points of growth. Uh, I think it's attainable, but uh, our kids are going to have to do wonderfully that day, and I feel that they're prepared. Next is Southeast Career Pathways, and this was a program that was uh, exclusively online as well. Under Superintendent Neal's leadership, she wanted us to transition to uh, a traditional style of pedagogy with some opportunities for students uh, to infuse technology into the program. Uh, they had a, a slight jump as well. And if, I don't know if you remember last year's results, they actually regressed from the fall assessment to the winter assessment. So although we have some optimism, we have two areas where we took a significant dip. And so uh, we were, this is a, a new mode of instruction. This is something that Southeast Career Pathways has not done before. They, were, they had limited test preparation because it was exclusively uh, credit recovery, online learning. So we're hoping we can pass that 13.4, but we will have to continue to get better every year. Next up is Union High School. Uh, Union High School uh, started in the fall at 14.3. Uh, in December, they had a composite jump of 0.6 points. Now they're at 14.9, almost 15. They need to grow uh, a little over a point to beat last year's numbers. Um, some preliminary data is telling us that they've already uh, gone over one hurdle in terms of graduation rate uh, from last year. And so uh, we really need to ensure that uh, their composite score this year is greater than last year's cohort. So just an overall uh, high school view. Uh, we have made about a one-point jump, one-point composite jump from September. Uh, my hope is that in March we have another one-point composite jump. And if we do have another one-point composite jump in the school district, uh, if you go back to the metric on the first slide, this will be considerably greater than that 17-1. Even if we grow by half of the amount, that we grew from September until January, it'll still be a jump that we haven't seen in quite some time. Um, our strategy, as I've um, made you well aware of before, is the attack the gap strategy, where we devote a portion of each class period to addressing skills on which the students struggle. We've had lots of success with this strategy, and uh, my hope is that we will continue to see growth, because as you noticed from my presentation, Every single school grew from September to December, and I anticipate that we will all grow from December until March. So that's my like 12 minute overview. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. So Mr. Grumman, yes, what, what is the exact point you really want all the schools to be at? So when I started last year with our team, uh, I, I did not want to be uh, the lowest scoring school district in Kent County. So that was the first goal. And there are two school districts that are lower than, 
lower than the Grand Rapids Public Schools in terms of uh, um, in regards to a, a composite ACT score. Uh, I would like to one day be one of the highest achieving high school divisions um, in the county and then one day be one of the highest achieving school districts in the county. Uh, this year we had a lofty goal in our division. We wanted to get to 17.5 uh, and our hope is that we can still get there. But I think that uh, even if we can go to 17.3, 17.4, continue that upward trajectory, uh, I, I don't really, although I would like to see huge spikes, uh, it's all about me maintaining, knowing that there are going to be some years where you may take a, a tenth of a point uh, spike in a downward direction. Uh, my hope is that we continue to see this uh, trajectory continue to go up. Uh, there are some college readiness targets set forth by ACT uh, where our students uh, need to hit those marks so they are not placed in developmental or remedial classes if they attend Grand Rapids Community College. Mm -hmm. um, if we can get them there, we can save them a lot of money because if they have to take those developmental courses at, let's say, CC or another college, they will spend all of their financial aid dollars on these classes that don't count for anything. And their odds of graduating are much lower. Correct. So uh, we, 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 think we're, uh, we think we're on the right path. We really do. Uh, one thing we did this year is put more emphasis on day two, which is the work keys assessment, uh, which the, with the work keys assessment, uh, they hand out uh, different certificates, uh, platinum, gold, silver, bronze. I think that's correct, Mrs. Reagan. Uh, we have one student in the Grand Rapids Public Schools who qualified for the platinum certificate, which means that she is eligible for 99% of the jobs in the Work Keys database. Uh, our goal this year is to ensure that all of our kids at least qualify for a bronze certificate so they can do uh, the jobs in the lowest percentile in the database. But um, I, I think we're moving in the right direction. Of course, we want to always keep schools off the lowest 5% list uh, because we don't want to see any students' lives disrupted or staff members' lives or principals' lives disrupted. We know how difficult that was for a union. But uh, I think if we continue doing this, we will beat out many schools that have uh, some of the sim similar challenges that we have. So we're going to try to keep it up. So will Ottawa score be a composite score for all the, your percentages? Yeah, so uh, with, with Ottawa right now, 15.7 uh, last year. One thing that held Ottawa back last year was their graduation rate. Uh, preliminary data, uh, are no, although not final, is showing that we had a pretty significant tick up. So we think we've gone over that hurdle. If you don't hit that graduation rate target, it's, it's very difficult to stay out of those low percentiles. Right. And we're looking at the, the, 80, the 80 percentile threshold is where we, where we want to be. So if we can hit that graduation rate hurdle and then do wonderfully in these areas, uh, I think everything else will take care of themselves. Um, I'm sorry I'm, I'm late. Oh, that's okay. Um, but with Union, what, with ELL, what percentage of those students are, are in this 17? About 50% of Union students. 50%. And then, so what are their ACT scores in? Would you like me to disaggregate those out? I can do that for next presentation if you like. If you would like me to get it into subgroups, I can absolutely do that for you. This was more of an overview, but I can absolutely disaggregate those data for you. For I mean, next if, time. You're, if your student body is 50% and their ELL categories, then yes, sir. that would definitely affect you. Absolutely. They're doing they, they have more uh, kids uh, taking the WIDA assessment than they do taking the Michigan Merit exam. So although this is a, a process where we uh, pay a great deal of attention, uh, about half of their kids are taking another assessment that takes a tremendous amount of time. So although this is, this is probably most important in terms of school accountability, Union spends a lot of its time testing about 50% of its population. Um, Dr. Baker, any other questions? Well, we can discuss that disaggregated data as something we can do for, I mean, we can discuss it later if that's sort of something yeah, we want I, I to get. come so. back and, and we can share that information. Um, and uh, my hope is that I'm coming back in a couple of months uh, showing you some nice gains, comparable to the gains we saw from fall to winter. I hope. Ms. Slay, do you have any questions regarding this data? No, thanks. I'm paying attention to it, and I'll be at the um, Ottawa governance thing tomorrow, too, so I'll probably hear a lot of this data again. 
Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, before we just start, we actually um, jumped past public comment. Yes. And uh, so I want to make sure that we don't do that. And I specifically invited, uh, we have, the link is, uh, for those of you that know Link, Link Community Revitalization is actually training their uh, families to be engaged in uh, participating in public bodies such as this one. So anyway, I wanted to make sure that in the future and if you have anything to say now, is there any public comment from anyone? But in the future, welcome. And it would be really nice to create a dialogue around issues if you have questions. So always feel free to let us know. So. Um, Anyway, okay, now we can uh, move on to, since there's Actually, no. you've already made the adjustment that I was going to. Oh, thank, right. you, thank you for making that adjustment for us. Um, so that does take us back to instructional council and uh, uh, public comment and instructional council. I just didn't want us to lose sight of that. I just want to Mr. Mm -hmm. Goldman to go, because he had to go. <laughs> You can go ahead, Louise. <laughs> We're just, uh, we have to so know instructional who we are. Council, instructional <laughs> Council update. Is, uh, it's an Instructional Council update from the, um, and this is, again, a personal report from the Instructional Council chair um, because the minutes have not yet been approved. Uh, we met on January 17th and we supported some uh, course changes. The biggest one was the School of Business, uh, of Building and Construction had two design courses which came before us a couple of years ago. Um, so we are pleased to see that the process is uh, moving along, that they've run this course for a couple, the, both of these courses for a couple of years, and they made improvements and changes. Um, the biggest change, as far as we were concerned, is that initially the curriculum required an out-of-state trip, and we were very hesitant about that. It turns out that they didn't go on the out-of-state trip because of funding, and so they've taken that out of the curriculum. Um, but they have added a number of other things, which are a lot of math and science. And the students, now that they've moved to the um, Innovation Central campus, are actually enrolled in these courses for three hours a day. But they were only receiving uh, 0.5 credit, so like a one hour's worth of credit for the three hours of, cl of courses. Um, the main reason that this came back to us, apparently there was some thought that it should come back to Instructional Council for those additional credits to make sure that people got credits appropriate to how much time they were spending on those courses. So um, we've supported that. Um, the, the courses will be updated and the final written course will be put up on the website. Um, Superintendent Neal said that the, that course change for credits would also be made retroactive for students who've already completed the courses from the first semester. Um, because our feeling was if you're in a course for three hours, you ought to be able to get three hours of credit for it. Um, we also had the School of Business bring a business law class, which she's very enthusiastic about, which was supported by the council um, for next year. Um, I understand that that has been included into classes that are on offer for next year. So it's in the... Um, it's in the course catalogue. Um, and also, uh, per Superintendent Neal, I did go back and contact everybody whose courses we've supported as preliminary courses to say you must make sure that you get us the final course by May because we don't want to end up in this situation where we have supported preliminary courses and then there's no curriculum on file. Um, there's no syllabus for people to follow. There, uh, and once, once you explain to people is, this is so that suppose you leave, retire, whatever, and uh, a, a new teacher has to, take this, has to teach this course. We want to make sure that they have something, not that they just have your brief outline, that they have everything in place to do that. So people are more on board with that, I think, as well. And the next meeting is on Thursday um, uh, in the GREA boardroom. So we feel we're being very productive, actually. We're quite excited. Yeah, this is, this is really nice to have an instructional council that works. And, and I was reporting here and doing good stuff. So um, 
you guys have any? Do I have any questions? I, I do. Uh, oh, uh, Ms. Light? Yes, I'd like to uh, congratulate Louise and the Instructional Council because it is now performing exactly the way that I always wanted it to. So <laughs> thank you very much. It's very good. <laughs> Appreciate it. Well, I have to say, it's, I don't think it's me at all, but there are a lot of people on there who are all very enthusiastic, mm -hmm. and we really appreciate your continued support and um, trying to get us to change things so that we're on the right track. So thank you. Great. It's great. Um, Matias? Yeah, I don't have any, any questions. Thank you. Okay. I did on my own. Okay. Yeah, it's fantastic that this is working well. Um, Actually, I had one. So the so the three hours of this the uh, design um, courses. So basically, the way students got credit for the extra time spent in that class was there was a, a recognition that they were learning more content from other courses at the same time, and so that allowed that. So, which sounds like the innovation that we would want to happen in a program like that, right? I, I looked at the, the course things that they have included because it's, it's, um, there's a lot of science and a lot of math in it. Um, and it's a different course, really, than we were presented with at the beginning. Even when she came initially two, year, two years ago and they presented this course, we were saying, is there time to do all this? So it is, it, it's got the course content is what you would want to see in something which is... Um, oriented to, to job performance, because as you know, in an actual job, you don't have things separated out. And I think it would be enormously difficult to separate these all of the things that are, are going on. Um, to be able to put it in one course, I think, is really good. And it is what we want to see, I think. It's what people are asking for across the country, uh, integrated courses. Yeah, it's fantastic. Cause, uh because I was thinking at first, how could you spend three hours in one class and then get the other things that you needed to be done? But if you're taking math and science at the same time, that's fantastic. Well, I'm having a look. I mean, I'm going, look at all this math here. Couldn't this be their fourth year math credit? But we're not there yet. I think we'd have to do some other things to be able to do that. But yeah, I think it could be a fourth year math credit. It could be another science credit. But I don't know how that would work in the computer system because the computer system is its own entity. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot. Um, great. Moving along, we're going to go to the weighted grading. Okay. Good afternoon, Dr. Baker, Pastor Moody, Reverend Matias, and Mrs. Slade. How are you? Good. 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 Great. Um, I'm coming to uh, bring to you a plan to um, include our college courses, which would include students who are involved in dual enrollment or early college, and uh, students who would take IB classes, <coughs> international baccalaureate classes. We'll also be included in our weighted grade um, formula. Feel that we want to ensure that there's academic value added to those courses, those college courses, those higher level courses. Um, and also, um, since the legislation has changed, that allows more and more students at earlier ages to uh, participate in dual enrollment um, based on their readiness, we want to make sure that we're able to promote and encourage more kids to take higher level courses, whether that's the college course, the AP course, uh, as well as uh, those who are involved in IB courses and for those courses to have an academic value that is um, above the standard uh, 4.0 scale. And so I just want to kind of thumb through some uh, pros and cons that we've talked about in small group there in terms of some of the benefits um, that weighted grades could um, yield to students who are participating in courses at the higher level. Um, we know that um, it adds more academic value taking the higher level courses. 
reflected in the cumulative GPA. We know most of our college institutions are recognizing those um, weighted grades and, and uh, place um, emphasis on those. Um, it challenges student learning for students who um, are in participating in those high level courses. We know the content is a lot more rigorous that they're exposed to and get a chance to um, even master. Um, we'll give students a competitive edge with college admissions. Prepare students better academically. Uh, and it could be, um, you can use it as a marketing feature of our high school programs in terms of students having access to um, AP, IB, as well as college courses there. Uh, some of the times we discussed you know, um, we were under a little bit of scrutiny from the OCR around kids having access to a higher level courses, in particular uh, referencing AP courses. But then um, to make sure that we're offering access to kids that are uh, that's aligned with the new legislation in terms of uh, college courses, I think will, will allow us to get ahead of the curve if there was ever um, uh, some more intense scrutiny around kids having access to those things. Parents who may excuse me, um, uh, maybe I missed this, but what, can, what is OCR? Oh, Office of Civil Rights. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, so Office of Civil Rights uh, could make inquiries and complaints about access to these programs. So very some students to, having different access right. to these. Okay, uh, very understand. similar to how um, they deal with the AP courses. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah. And so I said, you know, we can get ahead of the curve by, you know, making sure that we have um, offerings uh, for students. So this could increase the number of offerings for diverse groups? Yes. But if students aren't meeting their grades, it's difficult to offer that. Or if you did offer it and the student begins the class, then they're dropping it or they're, they're seeking. There, there, there are some qualifications to participate in the higher level courses. And so right. we would um, make sure those students who qualify high-level courses were the ones who um, end up participating because that ensures that uh, there's a level of readiness for that high-level course. So it's, it's, um, even though the legislation has changed to include more students, there's still qualifications to qualify for those high-level courses. What are the qualifications? Uh, the standardized test scores. Um, and in the, internally in the district, we look at students who are on track to graduate. Um, so uh, we look at um, also uh, some other readiness indicators in terms of um, not only age, but um, looking at um, whether students have uh, other responsibilities, you know, um, before we encourage them to take a college course, do they have outside jobs, do they have other uh, obligations that might impede upon um, their focus or attendance or attention to that particular course or those types of courses there. And then I have a question, are, are the students tracked? So, so if I, happen to score low in math and science, am I going to, you know, be geared towards those lower level courses as opposed to, you know, helping me get to an AP type course or something that's gonna be? Well, um, it, I wouldn't say tracked. Um, monitored uh, in terms of students who are demonstrating um, skills that would gear them down that path of high, high level courses and then those students who might need some academic reinforcement to reach uh, those levels, um, are what I would say that we're versus using the word track. Well, are there any counselors involved uh, in the school which deal with the academic value of the kids uh, who have better GPAs to put them in a higher uh, level of learning? Yeah, that's where um, a lot of the um, communication or contact or conversation take place is with the academic counselor uh, in terms of looking at students that they are on their quote unquote caseload or, or what part of the alphabet that they serve and looking at their academic performance and encouraging uh, them and their parents to consider some of the higher level courses there based on their demonstrated academic performance. Um, like I said, you know, one of the cons could be, you know, if we did not uh, expand our offerings or have solid offerings, you know, parents could, you know, choose to be in other places where those offerings are more readily available. Um, no weight um, can sometimes discourage students from taking the high level courses um, if uh, they know that their GPA might be impacted. Um, and so 
taking a higher level course, they may shy away from that. If it's, let's say, if it's on the standard 4.0 scale, but if it is above the standard 4.0 scale, uh, it might encourage more students because they know if I take a higher level course, it, I won't, um, and I don't get an A in the course, it won't be viewed, um, a B won't be equivalent to a B in the standard course there. So it could be a way to, to raise a GPA for students? Yeah, that would be one of the benefits. If you take a higher level course and um, <coughs> uh, they get the final grade could, you know, uh, raise their GPA. And there is a weighted um, GPA that shows up on the transcript. So could, how does a weight work? So, um, so if I got a, a C in an AP uh, course, okay. does that mean that it's a heavier C? Than <laughs> So it does mean it's a heavier C. Yeah. So it might bring my GPA down more. Um, yeah. Well, well um, let's go down and look at the, uh, the scale here. Uh, here are some examples of what the courses could be. Uh, of, of all the approved courses that students participate, here's an example of the type of courses that uh, would, could or would be weighted. And then if we look at what a scale would look like. Uh, the standard 4.0 scale, where an A is equivalent to 4.0, B 3.0, C 3.0 uh, there. Um, the honors piece in the middle well, is just a proposal we're looking at, taking a look at, uh, but that could be a possible um, uh, proposal that comes uh, back before the achievement committee. But then at the end, you have the AP dual enrollment ID weighted at 1.5, so a A well, one of those type of courses would be equivalent to 5.0. A C would be equivalent to 2.5. Um, so a C and an AP course would still improve my GPA, sure. okay, if I had a C in a regular course. And keep in mind, and because the, the, rigor, the content is a lot more rigorous, okay. you know, um, sometimes the depth of uh, the course um, materials that's covered um, is a, it's a lot deeper than um, as maybe some of the traditional courses. So there we want to make sure that because those kids are challenging themselves and putting themselves in a more challenging academic environment, there is an academic benefit um, that's attached to that. So does that scale make sense? Makes sense to me. Yep, yep. Great. Um, and now uh, one of the things that um, uh, appears in the Board of Ed Policy already is that the formula to weight grades uh, had already been approved. Um, and it began with the class of 2012 for AP courses. <coughs> and so uh, the only uh, amendment or change that would be would that uh, would be would that statement would include dual enrollment in IV classes. So um, the weights would apply to advanced placement, dual enrollment, IV, uh, and then the language would be the same and the formula would be the same. And it's um, you know appearing everywhere. So here's some of our neighboring school districts who, um, <coughs> those are just a few, um, participate in, in having weighted grades for advanced courses. Um, so that really does you know encourages students to challenge themselves and, and um, take on more rigorous academic content. You know how how do some of these conversations take place with parents? So if I'm a parent and um, and you're the guidance counselor, and you're trying to convince my son to take some courses that are going to be, you know, tougher, but they're going to pay off. How would you, how would you converse with a parent? Um, you know, obviously, you most likely the student, but if the parent saw something like this and said, "Hey, wait, I want Johnny to take," Johnny may not want to, but you know, um, the advantage is that it's going to prepare him better for college or these opportunities, and so hopefully he'll sacrifice. But how would you converse with a parent to talk about this value? Maybe I can, maybe I can a counselor come on up and, and actually talk with you about that. You know, one of the things that we do encourage is to try to prepare to see um, one of the economic benefits um, with kids who didn't earn college credit uh, while they're still in high school, because we're taking up the tab for that. And so there are fewer college classes that you need to take once you enter into college and so that financial aid or, or finance that was going to be dedicated to certain classes no longer exists because you took them in high school. 
Uh, I'll let uh, uh, Judge Baby, who's actually a, a counsel, talk to you about how that conversation um, originates and what takes place then. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, beginning of eighth grade, students and families receive a letter um, with the information on dual enrollment, um, ID, AP courses. Um, counselors also do presentations in classrooms, um, parent university, other workshops to make sure uh, parents and families are aware of um, these opportunities. We also just developed um, a new letter and a brochure to um, roll out. I believe we're sending them out next week. Uh, we wanted to make sure we brought this to the board first, respectfully, and then uh, next week we will, uh, if there aren't any further questions, we'll be sending that information out to all eighth through 11th graders. Dr. Baker, can you ask her to speak up a little bit? Uh -huh. Uh, Ms. Evans, uh, Ms. Evans, could, yeah, if you could come forward. Thanks, thanks, Mom. Sorry. Um, okay. Is that Malika? No, it's Carolyn. Now it's oh, Carolyn. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Carolyn. Hi. How are you? Good. I have a question when you get a chance. Okay. Um, the question was about informing parents, uh, and one of our goals this year was to inform parents on a broader basis. Uh, we created a uh, brochure. Uh, I think it was a team of individuals. We vetted it through legal services on and on, uh, worked with Susan's office, uh, Ron's office, to develop a brochure that will be sent out to all 8th through 11th graders and their parents. Uh, we wanted to uh, send it out on a broad basis because we thought by getting it out to eighth graders early, we could kind of plant the seed about the importance of uh, considering dual enrollment or advanced placement courses, uh, even though they aren't in the position uh, to begin that process right now. Also, students who receive um, a B in uh, previous courses are um, slated to take the AP who um, meet the qualifications of dual enrollment, looking at their test scores and their GPAs to have that conversation with them to encourage them to um, take that opportunity to dual enroll. We're taking advantage of Parent University as well, and we have counselors as well as curriculum supervisors going to classrooms to ensure that they are aware of these opportunities. We have found that our kids struggle most with transitions, and transitioning from high school to college is a huge transition. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is be more deliberate in getting them into college courses while they were still in high school, and we could provide uh, support if they should need it. Ms. Slade, your, your question? Yeah, I have a, a couple comments. One, um, one question I have is, is there any specialized training for teachers who teach honors level courses? I'm reading that under the honors column, but that one, uh, I have a question on that. Is there specialized training for those who teach honors level? Y yes. Um Actually, there are two sessions. We've been meeting with a, a consultant uh, for probably a year now, and uh, he has offered us a beginner's course. So last year, we sent a group of teachers through uh, a special training to prepare them for AP courses. Uh, we are offering that same uh, training. It's a week-long training. I think it's in July and June and July uh, of this year. And at one time, uh, we didn't make it mandatory, but we have met with principals and we've said to them, we want them to uh, find their strongest teachers uh, and identify them early, inform them of the training. And if they are not trained, we're going to ask that they um, uh, perhaps offer a different course until that teacher or they have someone that can be trained. But the training is mandatory. The training is mandatory? Yes. Good. I have one other comment. Um, in, in light of the conversation about how wonderful it is for these kids to get um, courses under their belt prior to college, the program at Ferris, uh, Dr. Baker, um, is one we should pursue. Yes. The one that we listened to the other night. Oh, yes. Yes. That was an excellent. Um, there's, it sounds like there's some meetings already planned. Wonderful. Great. Uh, in a, the AP court, I have two questions. 
guys have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, two questions. One is uh, for AP um, dual enrollment and IB courses, uh, if the student gets a D or an E, it says no wait. What happens to that that student to that course? So typically, a student, if it was a standard course, would have theoretically passed the class and moved on. Mm -hmm. But um, so it would they, just be no credit. It just wouldn't. Count. No, they they're do. Like, I'm sorry. With a D, they will still get the 1.0. Um, oh, they would just calculation. Oh, we just revert back right, to the correct. standard. Okay, I see. And then secondly, uh, are these courses, I mean, so going back to the Office of Civil Rights uh, concern, is are all of these courses available at each of the high schools currently? No. Uh, and uh, we are actually pushing, we've added more courses to uh, the course selection process. Uh, part of the challenge is getting enough students that are interested in taking the course so that we have a full cohort. So we have uh, included the courses with the hope that we will have more interest. Um, but it is based upon interest and teachers' willingness to be trained. And while we um, are still working on that, we did take a step to provide There's a college course offered right on their campus. So we're, we're, we're stepping out and um, making it even more flexible for students to have access who they might not traditionally fit in their schedule because they might be an athlete, they don't have time to commute downtown on campus and whatnot. So, there's a, so we're offering courses right on the high school campuses. Those are courses that are taught by college right. professors who are coming in to teach that class. Okay, that's great. So in a way, in a way it sounds like this weightedness is happening so the students so if you get a 3.0 and you took these classes in GRPS currently you could be at a disadvantage compared to students from other school districts who have the same 3.0 that is and correct. colleges aren't looking at whether or not your AP course count as a weighted course or not it's just mm -hmm. a, that ends up being money also because a lot of scholarships are just pegged straight to uh, GPA so mm -hmm. okay. anything else on this topic I had a question and it just escaped me. Not sure where it went. So, so with the parents, the, so the conversation with the parents are the advantage that it would be to their child if that child took weighted classes or AP Correct. Ki kinds of AP work. courses. Um, at the end, there's a test in the spring in May. If they um, meet the qualifying scores, then they can. Um, earn college credit for it. Dual enrollment, you'll get direct college credit. So that's another benefit which could possibly save um, parents money on tuition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Reverend Matias, we also highlight the, the opportunity to accumulate college credit while they are still in high school. And I think that's significant for the students that we service. We like to build up their confidence that they are truly college students and they're able to handle college level work. So I think it goes back to that whole transition piece. Uh, it's kind of nurturing that transition from high school to college, ensuring that they have some college like experiences before they leave us and while they still have access to support should they need it. I think they definitely need examples. I mean, I know of folks who have gotten a semester's worth of college credit having graduated from high school and I mean, when you can directly say this is worth five thousand dollars, because right. it you know, it allowed that those courses to be added to my you know to the classes that I was taking, and therefore I was able to, to do this, that, and the other thing, interest courses or, or other kinds of stuff. But with the new law um, as of last mm -hmm. year, students grades nine through twelve can now dual enroll for a total of ten classes throughout their high school career. So that's possibly thirty. So they can yeah. I know what I was going to ask. How does um, the math and science in for eighth grade everyday math transition into into high school? In other words, how well do our kids function in math and science, having gone through everyday math into you know algebra and those other kinds of classes? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm going to put a plug in right now, but you know, I'm, we're ready for our new math series. <laughs> uh, and we are actually studying um, other districts around the country based upon their NAEP scores and uh, other uh, districts around the state based upon their NAEP scores because we would like to bring a recommendation to the board to the superintendent first, rather, and then to the board around a new a math series. Uh, we've done a lot of augmenting of the everyday math uh, series, and we've probably patched that series up to the extent that we can't do it anymore. Um, but we have the new Common Core State Standards um, that we think that perhaps a series a new series would be instrumental in helping us prepare kids uh, better for their high school courses and beyond. Thank you. So even though it has some positive points at this point, I'm not ready to say that it's, it will be my choice. Uh, we've taken the cycle out of the everyday math series and we've asked uh, teachers to teach for mastery. We did a lot of restructuring of this, the series. Uh, they primarily used it for a resource, and we created pacing documents and purchased support materials through the University of, of Pittsburgh um, this year to augment that series. But, so there's been a lot of work around everyday math, and one of the reasons that we did that was because everyday math did, in fact, uh, put out a new series. However, when speaking to other districts, they, they indicated that very little had changed and that they recommended that we wait another year uh, before we purchase so that they could more fully align the series to Common Court State Standards and the demands that they would see at middle and high. So then, so then the, the math classes that would have gone into the Common Core that's hopefully coming into play had not changed much in terms of everyday math and those concepts? It, uh, not in the series. Okay. Uh, we, we have augmented, as I said, uh, quite extensively and restructured everyday math so that it probably is not the same series. Okay. But that's an expensive way to go as well. I mean, the units that we purchase uh, for, uh, for each grade level were quite expensive. And uh, I think we would, I, I see many advantages to at least studying other districts to see what tools they are using before we do anything else. have our, our last report to the committee, which is the overview of the year two priority school process. So, welcome. Nice to be back. Um, this month, what we would like to share with the Academic Achievement Committee is a bit of a review from last fall. Um, knowing that we had some new members join, we wanted to spend just a few minutes going over some things that we've talked about in the past. Um, specifically, so this is looking this month just specifically at five priority schools. 
and um, wanting to kind of review what is a priority school, how did our schools end up priority schools. Um, comes down to the top to bottom list, really, and that schools were ranked uh, from zero to, to five on the top to bottom list that came out in August. And in this case, the five schools that you have written reports for were schools that were identified in the cohort of 2013. So we generally refer to those as year two schools at this point. Um, to get on the top to bottom list at the elementary and middle school level, uh, it's based on 50% student achievement, uh, achievement growth is 25%, and then that achievement gap of 25% and the gap is between the average student scale scores of the top 30 and the bottom 30 percent. Okay. So again, we mentioned that a priority school is ranked in the bottom 5 percent of the school, or of the state. Uh, it is based on, at elementary and middle school, on your meet scores exclusively. Um, for high schools, any school that has a graduation rate of less than 60% for those consecutive three years, um, that will automatically put you in that list. So it is identification for four years. So our schools that were identified as cohort 2012 are identified for four years. That first year was planning and now our schools are actually in implementation phase is where they're at. So they're in their second year, which lasts until 2016, um, and they are actively implementing their plans. So our schools have developed a reform and redesign plan using one of the four intervention models. Um, and in this case, those schools, it was the transformation plan that was selected for those schools. And that the schools are Aberdeen, um, see if I can get this right, Aberdeen, Brookside Campus, Kent Hills, and Mulet Park. Uh, Aberdeen is a K-8 and the other schools are K-5 schools. Um, the plans were approved last year and again they are in their year two. Okay. MDE has been in at least once and in several of the schools twice so far this year and um, they have provided feedback to each of the schools and really the focus this year is on three different areas. It's on requirement four, six, and seven um, and that covers professional development, uh, PLCs, and, um, and the strategies that the schools have chosen to implement in their building. So those are the areas that MDE is really focusing their monitoring on this year. Really making sure that the strategies that the schools have chosen, whether it's quality questioning, uh, differentiation, um, that the schools have developed an implementation plan and that they're really implementing and monitoring with fidelity and making tweaks along the way so that the strategies are embedded very deeply into their program. What this slide is, is this is just kind of a big overview of, of the schools that are, have been identified over the last few years. So you'll notice that we have our SIG schools that are listed on here, our priority schools that are year two, um, which you do have reports on. And then our priority schools, which are year one schools. And um, those plans were submitted in January. And um, we have two schools that we are just awaiting official communication that um, the plans have been approved. And, um, and we are also, those schools are also all implementing this second semester. They're beginning their phases of implementation and they'll be at full implementation by the Yes, um, all the plans that have been submitted by all, all levels, uh, is it a possibility that we can get an opportunity to read or see those plans? So um, for additional information, these are two MDE websites. All the plans that were approved, so previous years, whether it's the school improvement grant plans or the 2012 cohort plans, they are posted on MDE's website. But I can also oh, make those available, but they are there too. So they are public documents. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank no you. problem. Were those, were those um, the same as the ones that were presented to us in the fall? Okay, so, so, you so they, should be, they should be in our previous packets as well. Right. So in October, I believe. That's correct. Yeah. So. That's correct. 
So there's, but there's nothing been updated since those October plans. No. And what about what the were there some adjustments to these four schools? So. No. No, past abuse okay. plans okay. that have not been. It wasn't sent off the MDE and then and there's some alterations. That was year one schools. So oh, year schools, one schools. Okay. Exactly. Oh, right. you're right. Exactly. I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry. yep. No, that's that's why. Um, yeah. That's why we have this slide. Right. <laughs> so yeah, that there you go. we Thanks. can all. I got it. <laughs> that helps us stay on track. So those um, those schools, which would be MLK, Dickinson, and Ottawa, um, we do know that right. MLK is approved in Dickinson and Ottawa. We're just waiting for final. Right. Okay. So we're good. Sorry about right. that. Anything else? How uh, informed are parents in regards to their school um, being a priority school and, and what that means? and? So we are required to notify parents. So when a school is identified, and we are required, we have, I believe it's about 30 days to notify parents um, <coughs> in writing. Mm -hmm. And we have to do that every year that the school is a priority year. But also it's a part of the conversation at the school level. So through those um, Title I monthly parent meetings, um, parents are informed and kept up to date as to the progress that the school is making. Thank you. So real quick, just for the record, there are, there's a review of these updates on, in our packet as well. There is. Okay. So for each of the five year two schools, there is an update for you. And then we will be back next month. And next month, the update will be um, the year one schools. Principals of the year two schools are here if you had specific questions that you were interested in having answered. That's why we have an audience. <laughs> so, if somebody told them they need to be here. <laughs> so. Does that mean there's not a crowd there? <laughs> well, you can count, if you look at your packet, the, the number of priority schools, that's the number of audience members. Yeah, then there's one person who came just to see you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry we can't see my picture because you can see how dressed up I am. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to work on these, uh, we'll the FaceTime. Uh, uh, <laughs> so I do have questions, I guess, for the principal in terms of, of how, you're, how you're working with the parents. So the Title I monies, what does that look like? Are they PTO meetings? Are they, what, how are the parents? Uh, we do Title I nights once a month. And like last month, uh, we either did math or science activities, games. and then they were sent home with materials. But before that, we have a dinner, and then I do have a conversation with them just saying, you know, reiterating, like Ms. Peck said, that we're a priority school. We're working on improving um, reading and math specifically um, so that, that can lead to growth in other content areas, social science, social studies, and science. Uh, we do talk at the beginning of the year at our annual curriculum meeting about being a priority school and then the letter is sent home, so. Are we welcome to come to those? Absolutely. Uh, how, so in a way it sounds like the parent meetings are, is a strategy to address um, the achievement, right? Because you're including the parents and in strategies to help the kids learn better. Yeah, the purpose of the Title I night is to get parents involved in the curriculum Okay. Um, working with their child at home or children at home. Okay. Uh, and showing them what we're doing in schools. Okay, and then what percentage of parents would you say are coming to the parent nights? It depends. It just depends. Some nights there's 150 people there. Okay. 
okay, great. The last event that I had was another snowy night. Go figure. Right, right. Um, but we still had about 75 people. Okay, so pretty good percentage so of, of the throughout the year that all the most of the parents are coming at some point. You know, point. You, you get kind of the same group of parents that are coming, mm -hmm. um, but you know it, it fluctuates. It really does. Depends on the weather. That's a huge factor. Huge factor. Mm -hmm. I think the activity makes a difference too because if it's um, just the conversation, the activity um, usually have a lower turnout. We just had a Kent Hill um, Muffins with Mom, and in which I handed out the vocabulary that's tested on the math test to all the moms, and they read a book, you know, with their child. Uh, it was well attended, and the transportation was not happy with us because we couldn't get through the parking lot. But um, so it depends on the activity. You know, if it's just about homework, you might have a small crowd. But if it's about, you know, Muffins with Mom, I mean, they all want to come in and have their picture taken. We use those opportunities to really talk about the important things that you can do with your children. It's a good thing. And so requirement 11 in the plans, in the transformation uh -huh. plan that these schools wrote, that addresses the ways that schools, they do have to come up with a plan for identifying and reaching out to the community and to parents. Mm -hmm. because. At the end of the day, it's the whole community, the school community, parent community, and the larger community that's going to support students to, to increase achievement. So that is a part of the reform and redesign plan. It's how are we going to work with parents to bring students along. Does that plan include how to assist teachers in the equipment that they need for teaching? So meaning when you say equipment, what I do you mean? I mean like, you know, books, tools, writings, computers. Yeah. Laptops. No, unfortunately, it does not. No. So um, there is not additional funding that goes with being identified as a priority school. Uh, as there was maybe with the school improvement grant schools, there was additional funding, which provided some flexibility. But that's not, um, not the way priority schools are designated. The district does have some set aside, meaning that part of the Title I budget um, at the district level and at the school level does address some of the needs or the targeted interventions that schools have. They can buy some funds there, but there is not, there is no additional dollars that come in. But you need additional dollars, all right? <laughs> yes. Would be helpful, yes. <laughs> Very much so. I talked to that other committee, so. Um, <laughs> so. Um, well, I like the parent, is so it sounds like the parent, it's really more of to get parents to take a stake of ownership of the outcome of the priority school success rather than being seen as like a consumer model that this, people go home with a letter saying your school is on the bottom 5% list and then therefore we should shop around for other schools. But it is really an ownership from the community and, and the vantage point of including the parents. So, And teaching them how, how to do right. those things that will help their child succeed. So, yeah. you know, I know when the light bulb goes on in a parent's mind, oh, wow, I know how to do this. Yeah. You know, it's right. they're eager to um, show yeah. their kids and vice versa, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how many parents have opted to not be, like, specifically at Neelec, but this is my third year, and I still see a lot of the same faces in families. So I'm not sure how many people are actually leaving. Okay, well that's that's nice. That's really nice to hear. So, yeah, you should invite the principals more often. That's all you had to say, Mr. Baker. So, sorry, I guess that might mean it's a mess with your afternoons in the future. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, let me check this agenda. That is the last. Um, update to the board. So, um, a couple uh, brief discussion amongst um, the committee members. Um, one is that we have now agreed, and so hopefully publicly people will get the word, for all those people that were, we would have had a larger audience if they'd have known we shifted to the third Tuesday, but anyway, um, 
we need to uh, make sure that, that, that it's known the third Tuesday at 4 o'clock is our meeting time. And someday it'll stop snowing and uh, Miss Slade will be able to get out of her neighborhood. Um, <laughs> so um, so um, also I would like to, are there topics that we should be considering? I'd like the, um, the committee members to consider. So we're, this is our, the first meeting of the new committee. And um, even though we do have a new member, uh, Reverend Matias um, is a new member of this, taking uh, Reynard Ross's place. Um, but you know, we have so this would be the committee that we have for the year until December. So, uh, are there issues, concerns that we should um, continue? I think that I like the the kind of flow that we've had going with the instructional council updates, uh, the, the taking the role of the um, priority schools uh, oversight. Uh, in terms of the board's role, um, and then also getting some up to updates on important things like test scores as they come in. But um, do people have other? Yes, things? I do. I, I like to hear and see more data on zero tolerance, absenteeism, and expulsions, and compare it to data in the past if you have it. Uh, and then I, Later on, I can uh, talk about how I would like to see that broken down. So this would be uh, a discussion of the suspension discipline policies yes. and as they relate to academics then. Um, so it would be particularly focused. I, I guess I would. Can you repeat that for me? I couldn't hear. So basically the discussion that we've had in the past relation to the discipline policy okay. but as it relates to the academics. Oh, all right. I guess I'd, I'd like to hear or, or, or even see some examples of, of parents that uh, the schools have engaged in, in regards to from their vantage point how they're seeing the implementation of, of those things or, or ways that the engagement is taking place and it's making sense to them as far as um, um, ways that you're implementing and, and partnering with parents. Um, so it'd be, it'd be nice to, you know, I know that that would be hard and asking maybe a lot to, to see some parents come in or some example of a parent that is, is saying, I wasn't engaged, but now I'm engaged, or even those that you're talking about that seem to always be there uh, and you can count on them. Uh, that would be, you know, one area to for them to be able to kind of report and really see um, uh, how they experienced one of these kinds of nights or, or those kinds of things. Um, and then the other is is you know the the school culture and how it. Um, I don't know how to how to phrase it, but just. Um, the sense of, of how the school is going in general for the student or, or, or that kind of thing, whether they feel it's safe and, and maybe it addresses some of that, but just, you know, how students engage and then the, you know, the, the cultural competency of teachers, how they're faring in, in regards to um, the, the students that they're teaching and, and some of the challenges that they face in, in trying to teach not just um, cross-culturally, but also students that are high achieving and, and those that, that are very low achieving and in the middle and trying to, trying to balance that with all, all that they have to, that they're challenged to do certainly every day. So that would be, you know, for me, part of, you know, our academic uh, committee to really help uh, teachers address some of that or look at ways that teachers are facing all these mandates that they're, especially in these priority schools, that they have to, that they have to fare with. So, Dr. Baker. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure that I heard everything uh, Reverend Matias said, but about the only way you can really judge what's going on with parents is to be with them when they're meeting. I mean, that mm -hmm. comes to my mind is, is uh, what, I'm, what I am hearing. Interested in how the parents are are assisting and how schools are functioning. It's almost like you need to attend their meetings to see who's there and how they're involved. And I don't know that we can get that from a report. 
Well, let's let's think about ways to do it. One is we we could perhaps you know get a list of meetings and see if each of us could at some time over the next few months attend one. Uh, there are um, I know that there's parent university, but is there is there anyone who district wide assists with parent engagement? Um, Ms. Evans. Yes, uh, Emmanuel Armstrong. Yeah. Yeah, I think that he is, and actually, even hearing from the principals, I mean, I don't know, I, didn't, I don't think I had a sense that there would that, like at Mullick Park, that there would be that large of a number of, of participants. So it's even good to hear from principals. But if there was some way, Emmanuel Armstrong, if he could participate at some point, um, or we, or I think that you were suggesting even actually trying to get a sense of having some parents come in and talk to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would so be it would be good if if Emmanuel would do something like that, because he has a pulse on some other kinds of activities and district-wide uh, efforts uh, as well so yeah so yeah it would be a good at least to get a, e even if it is just a report but it would be since it's such a key part of our uh, of the academic success it would be nice to, to get a sense that that's happening and what is happening and, and at least what we can expect from um, from the district in terms of their engagement with parents the other thing I don't know if this makes sense but to understand a little bit more how how elementary connects to the middle school connects to the high school and, you know we talk a lot yeah. about the feeder schools but it seems like sometimes there seems to be a disconnect between those um, and I know that there's some efforts to to connect that but um, so to get a sense of of how each one passes the baton to the other would be interesting That might be especially important in relationship to our sh shift to more K-8s um, in terms of the way that would be a nice thing to look at the transformation plan. Uh, I'd like to follow up on the, to some extent, the cultural competency, but really um, kind of discussion that when it matters that we discuss the ways that race and ethnicity matter. So for instance, especially with ELL, English language learners, um, what is the state of that? Um, and it, we haven't uh, had a, a, a broad discussion. Right. Not for a long time. I can't no. remember one. Um, but we did, we did uh, have a report on ELL, but that's been. Yeah, that's quite a while. Uh, that's, been, that's true. I think it was either when you were first in charge or I was. Maybe it was back when you but, were. Um, um, that would be good to revisit that. Um, and then, and, and I think that, like, um, you know, was questioned earlier about the, uh, the disaggregated data. So, again, to what extent, if we're looking at one school that has a higher number of ELL students, are the ACT scores explained by the difference uh, in language abilities, et cetera? And the other thing I think that, um, you know, we're, we've talked about um, the role of the historically black colleges and universities at Ottawa Hills. Uh, we've talked about the possibility of creating um, a Latino base, a cultural based high school, and, and it would be nice to have some discussions about the role of race and culture in the um, in, in our in what we're doing here. So, uh, if there's some ideas in general around that, but certainly ELL, and then certainly perhaps um, just maybe a, a session where we just look at the ethnic distinctiveness, and if there are distinct needs that happen because of ethnicity that we look at the way the uh, district is addressing those, which I know that we are, you know, um, so. Uh, That's a good idea. Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, uh, the challenges, and so this is something that worked the way we have typically set the agenda is that at some point in the next couple weeks, uh, Ms. Evans and I will hopefully schedule a meeting or if not a phone conversation, there will be things that will be pressing that she is expected to do for the board, such as these priority school updates. And then there will be time for some of these uh, reports <coughs> similar to say the, uh, the weighted grading or the Michigan merit examination. So this is something that we are requesting to have information brought to us at times. We would probably put these topics into those um, reports to the committee um, but we will have to kind of keep uh, discussing it so if the things that you want discussed don't get discussed by June or July because we only meet so really we're talking about nine to ten more meetings this year 
So we're, you know, we do this once a month. We may or may not have a, a July meeting, and then we hopefully might squeeze one in December. So it's hard to get everything in. So it'll be important for us to stay in communication. Um, and I'm saying that so that way, if you think something is important and you like it discussed at the next meeting, then Ms. Evans and I can do it. So it's not really a matter of uh, anyone forgetting about it. But what, mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Well, we can sit down and, and rough out a, a rough schedule for the year uh, in the next couple of weeks. But then. Um, but it, we can always add things to it. Um, but and we also have time because time is a problem and there will be things that we have to do. So when Mr. Gorman comes back to show us the, the new MME scores, that'll take time and we'll have to, mm -hmm. we'll want to do that. We won't want to, you know, not do that. So did we decide that we wanted to get those scores disaggregated for the next meeting or should we just wait until the new scores, are, the new MME scores are available. I thought Mr. Gorman said he was going to do that. At the next meeting? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so um, Carolyn, if we can make sure we do that too. So. Anything else for the next meeting that we should make sure is on the agenda? Okay, anybody have anything else? Hey, right, good. Thanks a lot. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Mo. Thanks a lot. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Thanks, Mo.